Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you ever wanted to attract and create a better life or a better world, then do we have the Shaman's Mind show for you. Today I'll be talking with Jonathan Hammond, teacher, energy healer, shamanic practitioner, spiritual counselor, Harvard graduate, and the author of my all-time favorite book on Hawaiian shamanism, Shaman's Mind. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about Huna wisdom and Hawaiian magic to attract and change your life. That plus we'll talk about Mercutio and present moments, turtles and Hanalei Bay, the power of Haleakala, eagles and condors, cliffs, ancestors and Kauai, turtle parties, Oscar Wilde incense, the power of Ho'oponopono, and what in the world shamanism with better beaches has to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Jonathan. Are you ready to shine? I am aloha. It's not, you really did read my book, didn't you? <laughs> you referenced the, some of the most specific things in it. That's fantastic. It's fantastic having you here as well. So before we dive right into things, you're a professional actor on Broadway. What happened when you visited the Hawaiian volcano of Haleakala, a volcano I was mentioning that my wife and I lived on and danced in for nearly four years? Well, I was uh, I was very dissatisfied in that life, uh, and um, but had no intention of changing it. And at that time, I hadn't even finished paying paying off my student loans from drama school. Yep. Uh, and uh, but I, I I was being called in a different direction, and it was on that volcano that I received a visitation with whatever you want to call it, God or spirit or the mother or uh, or the. Uh, some sort of energy in Hawaii, and it was a, a real, uh, you know, one of those formative spiritual experiences that you hear about that that, that happen very rarely. And from my walk uh, back up that that volcano crater, I had the thought, it's time to it's time to totally change your life, and um, and I let go of an entirely different life and and uh, began uh, b- becoming a spiritual teacher and and uh, spiritual practitioner full time, and now and now author. Uh, and that happened on the, on the volcano in Hawaii. Yep. And what an expansive space. Haleakala, if you've never been there, it's it's not just a volcanic crater on top of the world. In fact, it's house on top of the world. When you're inside of it, there is an energy, there is a buzz, there is an echo, there is an everything. And you became it, and it became you, and it recognized that you became it, and it became you. What in the world happened? Uh, it was... It, I. I it, it was a moment of I could feel that something was aware of me, although I couldn't see it. I could feel myself in clouds, you know, kind of white out. And I knew that something was aware of me, something huge was aware of me and that I was aware of it. And it knew what was happening. It knew that we were having an experience. And it was it was as if the, this this force was saying to me, I exist. I'm making myself really, really clear to you so that you know that you can – you are to make counterintuitive decisions in your life. And that's why I'm revealing myself to you in the way that I am So because I know you're going to be scared and I know there's going to be resistance to that. But I'm making this so clear because it was such a big vi- visitation that, um, that it became unmistakable. And you can feel you feel the energy up there. You feel, I mean, you feel it the the mana in in Hawaii, the the power of the land wherever you are. But up there, there is a buzzing. There is a, a sense of uh, uh, almost like a luminous field in, uh, 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 on the land. It's it's very 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 um, uh, intense and beautiful, and even even scary and um, and and deeply humbling. It's a really magical place, and it really revealed some of its secrets to me on that day. Wow. And it, it, it's interesting that it said that you said it, it would challenge you to make counterintuitive decisions, because now I would say that what you think was counterintuitive now you've learned is actually intuition speaking to you. That's right. And and everyone who is on the spiritual path are faced with, I'm going to either assimilate like I've always done, or I'm going to make counterintuitive decisions that are just based on what's going on inside me, following my own inner directionality, my own inner truth. And when we make those counterintuitive decisions, and what are they counterintuitive to? What everyone thinks, what yes. everyone else thinks. And and w- when we make when we make those choices, though that that adjusts the rudder of of our life, and that puts us on on the soul's path and on on um, on a on a specific. Uh, way of being that is different than what we, how we were raised, than, than what what the expectations of family or society are. And that is to live a spiritual life, and that is to follow the shamanic path as well. 
it's interesting. This kind of jumps ahead, but I think it's important right now because I believe we are all being challenged to go down that spiritual path. That basically, the time where we could think, well, I'm a spiritual person having a human existence, but I'm just going to have my human existence, or there's not even spirituality. It's gone. It's blown out of the water. And when we talk about this time, there's a virus or parasite that the Cree spoke of. Watiko, the Watiko virus. What was it? And why is it so important we understand that now? And this book was very prescient. So I'm going, now. That's right. It, 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 sometimes when I read the introduction, I can't believe that I wrote it a year ago and that, and that it, things are coming to fruition the way that they are. Uh, the, 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 what the Cree identified was, was a, a virus of the mind, a parasite of, of the mind that causes humans to self-cannibalize in their own greed, in their own toxic selfishness. And uh, and we can become infected with this, and we feel this. We feel that, that that this is so prevalent with so many people. And one of the reasons why the Earth has retaliated against us is in response to this virus in our own minds that so many people are infected with. And uh, the good news about it is that it's only in the um, but, but it's a non-local virus, meaning it, meaning it doesn't actually exist except in our minds. And with the awareness of it, we can begin to see that that. Uh, that the aspects of us that are maybe our darker nature, um, that, that, that can, those things can take hold, but we can, with our awareness, change that and become aware of that and usher in this new way of being. And which is what this time is on the planet. This is a time of, of, of a new consciousness. And it's not, a, um, it's not a highfalutin thing. It, it's a consciousness that, that presupposes unity and interconnection and love and, uh, and people over profits and right relationship with the earth. It's not something uh, deep, but, it's, it's, but if, if we actually did that and we pervasively did that, where most people were doing that, that's going to usher in this, this new way of being. And that's what this time is on the planet. Thank you. And I, I want to dive into Hawaiian magic and all things Huna and being a Hunatic in a minute. But before we do that, um, I've mentioned it on the show before. I, it is so incredibly profound. I would like you to share about it again. The time of the eagle and the condor flying together. Yeah. So uh, this comes. This is a Quechua prophecy. The Quechua uh, live in the high Andes of South America. And what they talked about is that this time on the planet, this 500 year interval, which roughly began around 1950, but we're talking shaman time, so you can't be too uh, too caught up on on exact dates. But this 500 year interval would be a time when the eagle and the condor fly together, dance together in the same sky. So the Quechua would talk about that the eagle, which is connected to uh, vision and uh and sight and technology and and science and intellect that the previous 2000 years were dominated by the eagle but now is a time when the condor will begin to uh, dance and fly with the eagle and the condor represents uh intuitive wisdom spiritual wisdom feminine uh, uh the feminine polarity something just occurred to me because i haven't shared this story on air since uh pre-covid Yep. Which, when I think of Eagle, I think of the time of Columbus. I think of the time of the conquistadors. I think we, mm -hmm. are, we are winding down that time period. And Condor mm -hmm. is like BLM, quite literally, dropping into the heart, saying we can't mm -hmm. go that way anymore. And I'm mm -hmm. looking at it playing itself out on the streets. Now, sometimes mm -hmm. it looks like it's playing out in, in, in kind of a violent fashion, maybe I should say. Mm -hmm. But there is an uplifting, an upwelling of humanity here that is saying the time of the eagle is past. That's absolutely it. And just to say too, you know, when 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 we're looking at shamanic healing, what we're looking at is when, when people present difficulties, illnesses, uh, uh, questioning long-held values, relationships blowing apart, jobs blowing apart. I know that the hidden gifts of the soul are contained in those hardships. And so even though on the one level this looks like this difficult, tumultuous time, the, the flip side of it, particularly from a shamanic perspective, is one of this great opportunity. And this is absolutely uh, happening as well. And this is a narrative you don't see on CNN that you don't see you don't see on the news. And it is one of of a deep cleansing of a uh, of a, a a huge rebirth that, that's happening that is going to lead to 
the equality between masculine and feminine, between receiving from the earth, which is what we're so good at, and returning to the earth, which we're uh, returning back to the earth, which, which we're not so good at. And that's what those two polarities, those two, those two great birds represent, that, that, we're com- that we're bringing a balance together, that it's not, just about, uh, it's not just about the intellect and dominion over nature, but it's about using our intellect to cooperate with the, with the earth, to cooperate with nature. And that's what we're moving toward as has been prophesied and that's the part that is is so amazing to me let's go from there and i have this little guy here by the name of henry oh <laughs> and, and henry represents my animal totem of the turn are you really you oh, too heck yeah mm-hmm. oh heck yeah when i got to maui i went for i was a, a free diver i was one of the crazy people who'd go down deep and a turtle appeared and flew with me. Turtles don't swim, they fly. I had a near-death experience a couple years later on the mainland. I was out of alignment. I came back to Maui to heal, and I was um, aqua jogging day after day by a little beach, of course, Mm -hmm. and there would always be a turtle that would come out and swim around me. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the turtle, what it means for you, if you don't mind, and what it means for humanity. Well, initially I had a dream of, of a turtle that came to me, and this was, this was many years ago in, the, in Central America, and, um, and I thought it was very strange because, because it, was just, it was just face-to-face, and the next day I, I was snorkeling, and that same turtle from my dream in this, with the same expression uh, actually came to me then. And then I, I began to kind of tune into what turtle meant. You know, and turtle is about ancient wisdom. Uh, uh, she's about patience, about uh, earth wisdom, um, about longevity, about home is always where you are. You wear your home on your back. Um, and uh, and th- that medicine just – uh, very much spoke to me, and I and, and then I began to see turtles everywhere. I, I turtles on on the sides of on the sides of buses and and uh, and uh, all kinds of things. So um, yeah, turtle has been um, when when there's uh, anything that's significant that's happening in my life, but some some way or other, turtle will show up. Even on that, um, well, I write about it in the book. On that vision that I had in Haleakala, I took pictures around my head to remember the place, and I even share one of the pictures in the book. Right next to my head, in the lava, is carved the face of a turtle, unmistakable, the face of a turtle, looking at me, smiling. And so um, it's very much. And I invite everyone: if you are meeting, if you are meeting animals in your in your um, waking life, everything is significant. Everything wants to connect. That is one of the basic um, uh, uh, the basic uh, ideas in in Huna wisdom, which is that everything is alive, everything is responsive, everything can connect to our thoughts, and everything wants to. And so that means when, when if you're having a connection with, um, with with a sentient being, it's there for a reason. And, and and be curious about that. It's it's fascinating. I do several interesting things. I sit meditate each morning with chipmunks and squirrels in my laps. It is the most glorious, magical thing in the world. I'm out for a run yesterday, and there's this worm writhing on the ground, throwing itself back and forth. I thought of taking a picture. Instead, I tried to usher it off. I'm like, you you seem like you're struggling. I'll usher you off to some grass. That worm, to me, represented this time of transformation, this time of thrashing back and forth, and Mm -hmm. actually to allow in for assistance, allow somebody to carry you to the grass right now to get mm. to softer, safer mm-hmm. ground. It all has meaning, doesn't it? it not only that, but I, I swear on all that's holy that I had a worm experience yesterday as well. <laughs> and, Tell me and more. I, and I, too, I was in the pool and he, was, and, uh, he or she was in there and I knew that she didn't want to be in there. And I, I, I took her out and I watched her uh, and, and it was the exact same thing <laughs> that happened yesterday. <laughs> High five. <laughs> High five. High five. All right. So yeah. from there, this is the perfect time. What is a hunatic? What is Hawaiian magic? So Huna is a, a shamanic philosophy that originated in Polynesia, and uh, it's a series, it's a set of ideas. And in some way, you've heard all, particularly if you, if you are are connected in some way spiritually or reading spiritual literature, you've heard these ideas before, but never have they been presented in such an elegant way and all in one place. And so there are seven principles 
um, that we follow in Huna. And by following them, by integrating them into our lives, we actually enter into and see through the lens of the indigenous shamans and not just the Hawaiian shamans, but cross-culturally all shamans. Having studied with shamans on, on three different comp- continents, I really have seen that they it's surprisingly similar practices, surprisingly similar worldviews. The, the Hawaiian one is the one that speaks the most to me. So that's, that's the, uh, that's where my destination has become. But they're all, they're all uh, uh, see the world through a specific lens. And this material helps bridge that for the Westerner. The Westerner. We're never going to be um, an authentic shaman like, like shamans who are born into a lineage. But we can really learn to think like them. And that's the reason why I named the book The Shaman's Mind because it's through working with the principles that we, uh, that we can merge our own mind with the, the magical thinking – the, uh, uh, the, 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 the way in which shamans problem solve, the way in which they heal, and we can merge our own mind with how they think and begin to think like they do. Thank you for saying that. You, I, th- I've got a conversation playing in my head. I can hear people saying, well, you can't call yourself. First off, you should never call yourself a shaman, I hear. And then I hear other people saying, well, you can't call yourself a shaman unless then you come from an, a lineage. And to me, it's all energy. It's all oneness. We are all one. And if we get into thinking with that shaman's mind, we are all for all sense and, uh, sense and purpose. We are shamans. And I think it's very important that we embrace that shamanic aspect today. It, it- that's right. This is such an important point because um, you know, I understand. I'm very sensitive to cultural appropriation. I write right. about it uh, extensively in my book. That said, uh, we don't. We have to be really careful, and we have to be aware that if this much uh, esoteric wisdom has presented itself to the masses, the spiritual at this time on the planet, the spiritual intelligences of the universe know what they're doing. And if we found our way to any any of it, it's because we're supposed to use it. Never have I studied with a shaman in Hawaii, uh, Thailand, Central America, South America, North America. Where else have I been? Never have I have I had the experience where they teach me something and they say, I'm teaching this, but I don't want you to share it with anyone. And I don't, and, and, and I need you to tell me I need you to tell everyone if you do share it with uh, uh, who gave it to you. It's not that at all. It is all just one mind. And so I think that you know one of the one of the Huna principles is the idea that the, the nature of the universe is limitlessness. That's the nature of the universe, which means that everything is available to us if we are extend our consciousness toward it. And so I think we have to be really careful of othering not only other people, but othering wisdom traditions that are all pointing toward the same thing, because we're all in this together. Thank you. And, and what I've heard with the shamans I've trained with, what I've heard from the other books written by shamans and, and other cultures, for instance, uh, uh, the Tibetan Lungonpa and, and some amazing uh, mystical people, for, a, for lack of another way, is if not now, then when? That in the past, it was supposed to be kept close to the chest or close to the sleeve. But now is the time where we need to share it with the world. We don't, we, we don't have time. We, we do not have time. And with something like this, it, it's like for me, when I came across this material, I did have the thought of like not Hawaiian. Uh, um, do I share it? I did get all the permission that I needed right. in order to share it. But that ultimately um, it's too good not to share. It's too good not to share. And it's too vital. And at this time on the planet, this new consciousness that we're ushering in is about right relation, is something more along the lines of the way in which indigenous people think of their existence on earth. That's what we're moving toward. And so we have a lot to learn in terms of those cultures. And if, 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 if a Westerner has been lucky enough to work with that culture enough to understand at least some of their ways, I'll never understand what it is fully to be a Hawaiian, but I do understand what they're trying to teach me about my own life. And the more that I can do that, the more I, I can teach other, others to do that, the more we're in alignment with the original peoples who lived successfully for millennia without all the th- trappings of technology and, and, uh, and so- sociological and economic structures that we have now. Thank you. So let's let's dive into the seven principles of Huna here. Yeah. And and we're not going to be able to dive in that thoroughly. Everybody, you're going to want the shaman's mind. We'll sh- tell you where to get it at the end. But principle number one, the world is what you think it is. That's right. The world is what you think it is. And just to say, these principles are a unique translation of seven seven Hawaiian words that are that uh, 
come from uh, a, a man named Serge Kahili King, who's my teacher. But the world is what you think it is. So this principle is saying that not only will you experience the world, that your experience of the world will be what it is based on how you think about it, but that the world itself, that reality itself will shift and change based on how you think about it. So that means that you have a, we are in a co-creative relationship with reality itself and that reality creates itself based on what's going on between our ears. So that's what that principle is stating. Which, yeah. which means that we get to be really, Pono, we'll use that word here, about what we think because reality bends to where you place your attention, sort of like you talk in the book about fake news and all of a sudden, how do you know what to believe? In fact, whatever you watch on the news, you will end up creating more of it if you at least don't detach from it and look at it as a fictitious story. That's exactly right. And not only that, but you are also uh, telling, dictating to the spiritual intelligences of the universe how they can work with you based on how you think. Because your beliefs cordon off reality and cordon off your experience of reality and cordon off your accessibility to spiritual guidance and help based on how uh, based on how you think. Because the spirit just goes, well, I can only work with what I can work with. And if this person has a myopic view and limited beliefs, then I, uh, in order to get to that person, I would have to I have to work around those beliefs. So, which leads to the second principle, which is limitlessness. Which means that which means that the more that we can remove that which uh, that which separates us separates us from our own experience from ourselves and others separates us from from the our imagination and what we can create in our own minds the more that we can remove that the more we are in alignment with the nature of reality itself the nature of the universe itself which which is limitless so this principle says anything is possible if you can figure out how to do it so backing up here for a second, because we're going to yeah. play with some of the magic in here. We're going to talk sure. about a, a, a key kupua, which is the magical power of choice. Mm. What does that have to do with anything? Well, uh, from, from a Huna perspective, we consider a, a, a magical um, a quality that we all possess to be choice because because we create reality with our minds, that means that we can choose that reality and we can choose how we see anything. It's just like what we talked about on the planet. We can either choose to see this as this difficult time that's very scary and who, who knows what's going to happen. That's one choice. But right next to that choice, we could choose that this is this, this fertile time, this time of rebirth, this time when we're all coming together. And whichever one you choose, whichever seat you claim, that will end up being your reality of this time and not just your your uh your opinion but your actual ex lived experience of this time so choice is so important because because w when we don't like what's happening our that whatever's ha whatever is happening that we don't like was created by our thoughts our thoughts and intentions and beliefs and we can change those in order to create something that we do want to happen Thank you. And so I'm going to pull on the golden string and I'm going to go yeah. from there. I'm going to go to the hundred monkey effect from the 1950s and sweet mm. potatoes, because whatever we think and act upon here, we are literally creating with our minds on the other, like the butterfly effect on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the hundred monkey effect is uh, essentially an experiment where um, a, a group of Japanese scientists taught monkeys to wash their sweet potatoes in the sea before they eat them. And what they discovered was that monkeys on another Japanese island simultaneously began exhibiting the same behavior without the instruction. And again, this speaks to this speaks to the limit, the limitlessness. And it also speaks to the power of prayer and how much we can affect the world just without ever leaving our home. Because if, if it is a limitless universe and if there's only one big thing happening and each of us being an aperture through which that one thing experiences itself, then that means that let me, let me whatever – Can you say that again? That was such a powerful line. Yeah. So there's only one thing happening of which we are an inextricable part of the one thing. A way to think of it is that is that we are the individual waves uh, th that can't separate themselves from the ocean. Yes. And we are an aperture through which that one thing experiences itself, but we cannot separate ourselves from that one thing. Then that means that to heal ourselves, to just to just bring love or healing or attention to yourself is to heal the macrocosm that we are an individual a representation of the entire cosmos. So my teacher, Serge King, would say, if you want to heal someone, think of them 
and you do what you need to do to feel good. That's going to jump ahead, and I don't want to go there yet, but I'm going to give as a teaser. We've got to talk about Ho'oponopono then, which sure. we, we, will, we will get to just before because we'll we've there. got to heal ourselves if we're going to heal those relationships. What's, right. You talk about the importance of naming what you want. Maybe you can explain that and explain a visioning exercise to get clear what you want. It's so important to name what you want. And, and just to say, it's, uh, it's epidemic. It's a pandemic that we don't. You know, we are we we let so many of our dreams go untended to go unclaimed and uh, and the, the, the spiritual intelligences can only work with what we are willing to receive. And that means that we have to actually be able to name what it is that we, what it is that we want to receive. And and this is not an egotistical uh, exercise or even a selfish one, because from a shamanic perspective, if you are full, if you are so well, the impulse will always be to give back. When you when you feel satiated, satiated, when you feel that it's always the next impulse is gratitude, and and the altruistic impulse that so many, certainly all your listeners would be following, is so much best best served when they're so full that they can't help but. And so to actually name what it is that you want and legitimize that and, you know, and, and reach, reach for it with your consciousness uh, and, and then to receive it is then to help other people do the same thing for them. That's the impulse. Thank you. And I would say unapologetically, without apology, ask for what you want because that is going to help you to help everyone. Let's go from there and let's talk about energy flows where attention goes. And I, I was doing a whole bunch of drumming before we started today and getting into ceremony. And I was fascinated to read about you doing a candle spell for LGBTQ clients because what you're doing is what I'm doing. Live in ceremony, live in prayer. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's a fa- it's it's a fantastic principle. So energy flows where attention goes. So what it means is, is that where we place our focus and attention, elicit the creative energies of the universe that will bring to us and create for us the nearest physical equivalent of what we place our focus and attention on. So that means that we live in a symbiotic universe that will gladly uh, and uh, that will gladly lend us some of its creative spark based on what we focus what we focus on and where we place our attention. So yeah, so I did a um, I, I wanted to attract at one point in my in my life. I've a, I've a private practice it used to be in New York City. It sort sort of is now, but it's all all online now. Uh, and I wanted to attract um, a certain population. I wanted to work with LGBTQ people. And I knew that I could do a social media campaign or I could advertise in certain places, but I also know that energy flows where attention goes. So I, um, I did a simple candle spell, which I talk about in the book, which was, I had a candle that symbolized the clients that I wanted to attract. And then this I, was I, a I, rainbow um, candle, of course, this, uh, this was a rainbow, a rainbow co- a candle. That's right. And, uh, and there's a, a metaphysical store, uh, that's kind of Wiccan in New York city that, uh, that actually had something called Oscar Wilde incense. <laughs> so I lit the Oscar Wilde incense just because it's thematically related. Yeah. And I held the candle and with the intention that when I, when I lit the candle, it would be sending out, it would be sending out a beacon of consciousness to those, those, uh, clients that I had yet to meet. And that the more that I focus, because because uh, energy flows where attention goes, the more I put my focus and attention on this. So I let it burn for it was a seven day candle. Uh, it would it would keep the energy flowing, and um, and so I did that, and I, I did a little ritual for myself, and um, and lit the candle, and then reaffirmed my attention by focusing it on it uh, again. And it took a it took not even a week, a couple days before I had this huge influx of uh, exactly that population of people. And I also talk about in the book that sometime if it doesn't happen that way, then that's information too. Because a key magical talent is choice, if, if you do a candle spell and it isn't bringing you what you want, then you can also choose to see how do I want to see that. Maybe I wasn't supposed to attract that kind of client. Maybe I'm, I'm supposed to take a break and not have new clients. Maybe, maybe the timing is off. There's all kinds of ways to look at it, but you always remain on your own team with a sense that you're co-creating your life. In connection with uh, in connection with the spiritual intelligences, and that if the spiritual intelligences are giving you something that is that is contrary to what you think you want, then your choice to uh, to see that uh, to see that as part of the opportunity it, uh, then opens a new door. 
earlier today. We we've been planning this this RV tour for a while, Inspire Nation tour. And yeah. uh, originally we wanted to go to Alaska. All the borders got closed. This morning I was like, ah, we can go take a ferry. I know this is what we can do, and and we can stay on the RV in the ferry. And even though we have kitties with us, and it could be a challenge, we can figure it out. And it seemed, felt a little like Sisyphus, but but I was I was excited nonetheless. I call up the ferry store, the ferry place earlier today. And I go, can you tell me if we go on a ferry during this COVID time, do we have to stay on the RV? Because we have the kitties, we wouldn't want to go sure. off and we wouldn't want to go hang like at the cruise ship. Can we stay on the RV or... And the power went out for a split second. All the lights come back on. It's just the computer that's off and my phone call is gone. And I'm like... All right. Thank you. I get it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> absolutely. You know, absolutely. One of my, one of the favorite spiritual advice I ever got was if the door closes, take the hint, you know, I, I, take the hint. It's a, it, it's happening for you. It's happening for you. And, um, it, it's so important that, that we follow that. It, uh, if we allow ourselves to, uh, remain in flow with the planet's intention for each of us. The earth has an intention to go on to love. And if we, al- and, and if we are, if we align with for ourselves that that is my intention, we will always be guided in that way. And so when the door closes, that is earth wisdom itself saying not the right direction for you. It's okay. And, and uh, take this hint. It's not what you think. And, and the earth the, the spiritual intelligences, they have such a better idea they are, they are about, about uh, what we need than we do. And they, they hold so many more surprises than our pea brains could come up with. And it's so important that we allow ourselves to, to listen to them. And when they say no, thank you. Yes. There's, there's a, a term that I got from a guest, and I haven't been able to look up the exact spelling of it. Even though I've tried, it's a Sanskrit term, which means prahaptma karma. And, and what that means is there is a path ascribed to us, like a contract on the other side. And if you are find you're pushing your stone again uphill, I'm creating with my mind, I'm creating with mine, and it's not creating, there's probably a greater reason for that. And be all right with that. Yes, yeah, say thank you for that. I want to switch gears from there. I want to go to number four. And I was talking about this at the beginning. Now, now, now is the moment of power. What does that mean? That's the fourth principle of Huna. You know, we hear about mindfulness and and uh, certainly there's so much written about that. But in, from a shamanic perspective, shamans don't want to abide in the moment. They want to do something with it. And and that's a fundamental difference. And and now is the only place where we can do something. And so that so that means it's the only place where we can access power. So you can't get burnt by yesterday's sun. You can't get wet by tomorrow's rain. The only place where you can actually do anything is right now. And not only that, but but um, because now is the only thing that actually exists, the past is you know gone, dead and buried. The future is not yet born. We can decide who we are right now based on who we decide we want to be right now. And this really uh, begins to uh, chip away at this idea that we have to – that we are carrying this slogging past through us that you know we can – every moment we can start over. That's what that principle is saying. And it's even, it's even saying that the things in our life that we didn't that, – that, that we've done in, in the past that, that are – that were unskillful, that were not good for us, that in the moment now we can begin to see that we were trying to do something. We were trying to meet a need. We were, we were acting from ignorance. We were acting from innocence. But right now we can actually see that as it is and let it go right now. And from that perspective, right now, blanket forgiveness – is usually the most appropriate uh, the most appropriate action that we can take right now to bring us up to date with ourselves. So much of it healing, so much of of um, of really being healthy and following the spiritual path and being creatively engaged with life is being: Are we in present time? Are we actually in present time? And it's so important that we harness that for ourselves. And we and and particularly now at this time on the planet, the invitation is stay very close to yourself because it's only by being so close to yourself and following your own intuitive voice and your own intuitive rhythms that will keep you safe, that will tell you where to go, that will cause you to go on a on, on a um, on a trailer tour. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 Aloha ma'i ki akua ipo. Love yourself as you love God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is um, this is one of the most important things that we can do because 
to love ourselves as we love God. What does that mean? That means revere yourself. That means worship yourself because it's not what we do. That's what we would do with the divine. And in doing that, what we're doing is simply aligning with the same divine love uh, that, that is waiting to shower us with love. But unless we are a vessel for love down here that we create down here, we, re we remain out of sympathetic vibration with the big love. And so to love yourself as you love God is simply to invite God into the same vibration that you're creating with your mind. Woohoo! Woohoo! Five, to love is to be happy with. Yeah, to love is to be happy with. So this is aloha. Uh, and the easiest thing to understand about this is that, um, that we're from in Huna, love is the only ethic. It's the only rule. So every intention and action we take, what we're looking for is it, what is love's perspective and is love's perspective present? And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's all a positive because sometimes love can be a brutal confrontation. Sometimes love can be I need to let you go. Sometimes love can be I can be uh, um, I have to put up a boundary. But what we are what we are looking for is that is that is love a part of how we are creating our lives, the decisions that we're making, the actions that we're taking. And, and, um, and what is love from a Huna perspective is what, is it bringing us happiness? That's how we know. That's how we know if, if we're feeling, if, if the result is happiness, then love was present. And so, so that's how we think about it. Thank you. Uh, my spiritual kapuna, Auntie Pua, who I write, write in automatic writing each day, she used to say at the dinner table uh, about taking more food, to shame is to starve. And, and you have an expression in here. You say that uh, to dare to dance the hula and leave that shame at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You know, we, are, uh, we live in a culture that is... Um, embedded in the unconscious is such judgment and uh and such fear and such such a sense of supposed to and such a sense of of the expectation to assimilate and you know one of the deep spiritual truths that i truly believe is revolutionary if we all do it is to stop caring what anyone thinks it will take you off the spiritual path it will it really will it will take you off the spiritual path and and take you away from yourself and send you into a life that is not yours when you start assimilating with others when you start uh, um, going along with the horde mentality that is seeing a life that they saw on television that's telling them how they're supposed to look and telling them what they're supposed to buy telling them what their money's supposed to look like telling them what, what black people are telling them what, you know and all of that and and it, our job as spiritual seekers is to come from ourselves and to leave singular singular lives that comes from our own truth and it's so important that that we do that and so so what that what that uh, hawaiian phrase is saying is that express if it's coming from you if it's coming from you there is no need to be ashamed express in a, in a state in, a, in a, an expression of yes woohoo all right, before we go on to number six, what is the art of act of blessing and how is it a key kapua or magical talent? Yeah, well, if anything that you want, you want to stay in the energy of what it is that you want. So if there's something that you don't want, you can either affirm what it is that you don't have, which then separates you from the energy of the thing that you want, or every time you see the thing you want or come across the thing you want, you can bless it. Uh, bless it by uh, which then puts you in the energy of that thing. So I go through a whole uh, a whole uh, exercise that you could do. If you want a better body, you bless the people who have bodies that that are are uh, like the ones that you want to have. See, we tend to withhold and judge and and become shameful, but by actually celebrating that which is of what we want, we actually r are, remain in that energetic current. You know, so if you want if you want a, a, a better career, bless the people that have the career that uh, that, that you want to have. Bless the qualities in you that are the seeds to get you there. So it keeps you in this in this uh, co-creative place uh, to bless and to bless is to create more of that which is blessable. <laughs> I love it. All right. Number six, all power comes from within. And tell us about Maui. So uh, Maui was a um, uh, an a demigod, and he created 
many things that that uh, the folklore talks about him lifting the sky to where it is today and reeling up the Hawaiian Islands with his magical fish hook and uh, and creating all the species of of, of fish uh, around the islands by by going after a villainous serpent, cutting that serpent into pieces and and sprinkling his uh, his remains uh, into the ocean, creating all these species of fish and creating coconuts. So Hawaii knew, or Maui knew how to make things happen. Which means that he he had an inner power, and we all have that inner power, and that is what mana is, which is where where this principle comes from. Mana, which which means all power comes from within. So so, and what is mana? Mana is just the power to create, the power to create that we each have individually inside of us. And not only do I have all the power, because remember I'm connected to the entire universe, as are you, which means I have all the universe's power, and so do you. But it, and that means that if anything outside of me has power over me, it's only because the power within me granted that thing the power to have authority over me. That's important. Tell me more about that, because that is so key for taking us out of victimhood and taking back our power. We have to. So, so if you think about the nature of power, power over is just going to lead to retaliation and fear. That's what power over is. That's That will be the result. Power against will just lead to resistance. But the power to empower means that mana, I mana. have the mana mana, which means I have the power in order to give the power to you. And so to be in a place, to be and to cultivate for ourselves lives and and life situations where where my one of the things that I want to do with my life is empower others is to cultivate your own power. And we all have all of it. And so to empower the other is just to say, as I have all of it, so do you too. So and it's so important that we do this but from a Huna perspective. Huna doesn't let you off the hook. It says that, and this can be difficult for people, and it and it and difficult in in um uh, in in ways where people get stuck. But Huna says that you there is a degree of complicity with everything that happens to you. The degree degree of your own complicity. And and that means that we have if we have the power to create things that we don't like, we have the power to create things that we do like. If we have the if, if something about us created ill health, we have the power within us to create health. That's what that principle is saying. A lot of what you're talking about today, selfishness to empower others. So taking care of ourselves to take care of others, forgiving ourselves to put ourselves back in the power. This this goes along this theme with degree of complicity. How do we not then blame ourselves as we look around the world, uh, our our lives, and say, I and to a degree, to a certain degree, I created this with my mind. I created this with our thoughts. How do we not then get down on ourselves, which then creates exactly what we do not want? Yeah, yeah. A lot of times, people in my trainings will say, right, "Does that mean you uh, that I created my own illness, you know, or, exactly. so, or some difficult life situation?" And that's a terrible thing to say. That's not at all. What we have to remember is that is that it doesn't that we have an unconscious mind, which means that there are aspects of us that are not conscious, that are not available to to us until we lend the light of our awareness to these things. And so, if something is showing up in your life. Uh, that 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 uh, that and you have a degree of complicity with its creation and you don't know where it came from. That means that there is something inside you that that has lied, that has lay in wait, so to speak, and um, and has unconsciously attracted that thing. And so then the opportunity becomes to address that. What in me uh, uh, um, connect, uh, 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 attracted that thing to? Also, just to say, it's not about blaming ourselves, but it is about responsibility. You know, this is a very low bar. It's a very low bar. But if everyone could just clean up their own mess so that their experience doesn't spill into the experience of, of another, and it's a very low bar, but if everyone could just do that. To me, the outer world is a reflection of the inner world. Right. Each of us is a cell of the whole of human beingness. So when you're saying it's a very small bar, clean up your own world, what we're doing is we're creating a, a cleaning up the subconscious or the psyche or the zeitgeist of the entire planet or of humanity. And of course, it's going to pop and change without you needing to take all of that external action. Did you read my book? <laughs> 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 that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
That's right. That's right. So it, you know, it's not about it's not about blaming yourself. It's not um, that doesn't do anything. It's it's about like uh, because just with with the sense of uh, even with if something bad comes into our lives, uh, there is a sense of of why what what's there? What's the opportunity there? See, in, in shamanic healing, what we're looking at is what a difficulty symbolizes. Yes. That is the most important thing. So when it when we're when there's an illness, a difficulty, a, a, a life situation, whatever you go to the shaman for to work on to heal, what we're looking at is what does that thing symbolize? And it either symbolizes that life sucks and this bad thing happened to you, or that or it's the light bulb that makes you finally see never again. That makes you finally see I I see I see my um my my com- complicity with this. I see what I didn't see before. And so therefore what that symbolizes is the light of a new awareness. And that's what we're always looking to do. And and that if we take it at the end of the day, a shaman's mind is somebody who's able to see clearly. To see clearly and to see, to see um, the other narrative. You know, the Course in Miracles talk, if uh, the Course in Miracles talks about, if if I were to summarize that big book, not that I've read it, but if I were to summarize what, uh, what I understand about it, it's that love and fear are always right next to each other. Love and fear are always, they're just right next to each other. And, um, and what I think the shaman's mind does more than anything else is that they, that the shaman is able to see both of those polarities at once, that which is being presented and that which is hidden. There's a concept you talk about, to- uh, the, the danger zone. What's that? The danger zone. Yeah, the danger. We're all we're, we're all in the danger zone right now. All of us right now, because the danger zone is about that. There's an old sense of self, particularly if we're on the spiritual path, if we're growing, you know, if, if, if we're growing, if we're seeking, uh, there's an old sense of self that no longer serves. We see that. We see that we're letting go of it in some way. There's a new sense of self that is not yet born. So we're right in the middle of those two things. So we're, we're the in the worm. But we're, that's right. That's right. We're the, we're the worm. But we're in that in-between place where the old sense of self no longer serves. The new sense of self has not been born or the new life. And to stay and, and in that place, that's the danger zone because you can't find the ground underneath your, underneath your feet. The answer a lot of times is I don't know, which is actually an answer. The in-between place is actually a place. And the only way to traverse it is with faith. Because it's in the danger zone that, that we must enter into in order to follow the soul's journey. Because we're, there's going to be – there's always a liminal space before we get to the thing. And we as – on a planet, and certainly in this country, are in that, limi- in that liminal place too. Because the, the, the old ways obviously don't work anymore and, and we have not yet resolved – all of these issues in such a way that this new world has has taken shape. So we're in that liminal place, and that's why we have to affirm uh, uh, we have to affirm faith and affirm that we're part of a process and that we're in a process. I, I think it's it's very much. Thank you for sharing. It's very much okay. You know, we can hold a vision, and and the more we hold a vision, the better. And I believe the more we emote, hold that vision from a place of how do we want it to feel. But the words "I don't have a clue" is to me perfectly appropriate right now because it's not grabbing all. On to the to the old and trying to hold on to the established with everything we've got because that's only going to hurt us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm telling clients. Uh, you know, my my practice is very full right now, and I, if I say it once, I say it ten times a day. I don't know is the answer. I don't know is the answer. Uh, and and if you if you remain close to yourself, I don't know changes on a dime, and you'll know exactly what to do. But until then, you stay in the I don't know, and you stay put. And you and you work on whatever it is that you need to work on so uh, to be ready for when that impulse comes that you have the freedom to go, to go do and be as you're supposed to. When I do my automatic writing, and I coach in my automatic writing as well, and I, 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 I do automatic writing while I'm doing this, just plugging into spirit. And the line that keeps coming to me, which is really tongue in cheek from spirit is, you're not allowed to know right now Mm, mm -hmm. yeah that's right that's right you know spirit that's right spirit is 30 steps ahead it's intelligent beyond intelligent and and that's exactly what that and and to be withheld from because you wouldn't know what to do with the information until it's time and actually, that goes back to uh, the the Huna tradition, which is about when when an apprentice would go to a Kahuna uh, to learn this wisdom, uh, the the Kahuna would only answer questions. 
He would, the kahuna would offer no information. The, the the tradition is one where the student asks a question and the kahuna answers and only answers the kahuna or the shaman and the kahuna answers only the exact question being asked. That to me is so important because if we had the power to have any question answered that we wanted, where's the growth? Where's the expansion? Where's the living? You might as well just be on the couch. That's right. And that's right. And, and what they were getting at is what is your question? Your, cre- your question is indicating where you are on, on the path. And if you, if, you are adjust, if you are adjusting subtly your question into another question, then you're somewhere else on the path. And so it puts the responsibility on the student that they're feeling into their own process for their own wisdom. Yeah. Knowledge given at the wrong time is at best knowledge wasted at worst knowledge exploited or misused. Yeah. And so what but so by by so this tradition is saying that when you have a question I will answer any question uh, and, uh, as best I can but that's all I will do because then you have to take responsibility for the answer. Thank you. And that's that's a lot of what we're talking about today taking responsibility which brings us to 7. And and I'm a kitchen sink kind of guy and so this fits in well with this. <laughs> Effectiveness <laughs> is the measure of truth. Effectiveness is the measure of truth. So that means if it works, it's true. And if it doesn't work, it's not true. And if you go along with the seven principles, that also means that – that is it creating more love? Because that because what is effective? Effective means that choice is involved. In fact, effective means that it's creating more love. Effective means that you're getting what you want. So, so just understand what effective is. But what it's saying is that the only truth is what's true for you. There is no – the only absolute truth is that everything is. That's the only absolute truth. Everything else is just something that someone made up, someone else's opinion. And so what this is what this principle is getting at is that it is only our individual truth as it works for us or doesn't work for us that decides what is effective for us and what isn't. And what I love about this philosophy is that it's you know it's a philosophy from 5000 miles away in Polynesia and it says oh, we don't have the answers. You have the answers. You know, there's a Hawaiian proverb that says all knowledge was not taught in one school. And, and what that's getting at is that, we, that we, don't, we don't have an – it's your own individual gnosis, your own individual knowing uh, that will align you with the path. And, and that's why it's so important that we don't other these, di- these different traditions because, because w- I- I- this indigenous wisdom from Polynesia is saying – you have permission to completely create your life from your experience, and that's what we're telling you to do. You know, and that has nothing to do with Hawaiian beliefs, Hawaiian values, Hawaiian culture. Even that just has to do with with a, a deep truth that we're all supposed to be entitled to feel. Woohoo! I want to talk about one of my all-time favorite words, Pono. Hmm. Yeah. So Pono, that Pono is uh, is the word that that last um, that last principle is is translated from uh, by Serge King. Uh, Pono means rightness, equanimity, true condition of nature. So a sense of a, a sense of a, a rightness, and um, a, a, and you can feel that even in in there's a quality of it's a felt experience that this just feels like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is right. The, the, I, I'm in alignment with myself. I'm in integrity with myself. I'm not. I'm not betraying myself. That's what. That's what Pono is. And Ho'oponopono, Pono, which is uh, the, um, uh, the the Hawaiian forgiveness practice, is is Pono. That rightness doubled. Pono Pono. So Ho'o is to make, or it's causative, to make right, which is Pono. But it's Pono Pono, which is to make doubly right, to make right with ourselves, to make right with God, to ma- to make right more right. That's what the Ho'oponopono practice is about. Can you share more about this practice? It's something I use in my practice. It's something you use in your practice. You share about learning it off of YouTube at first. Yep. And it just worked. What it can just, you tell us about this? It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, essentially um, anything inside us that is problematic, limiting, illness, low self-esteem, fear, doubt – uh, can't take action, whatever those things are, they were all born of unlove. All of them were born of unlove. And so to administer love directly to those problems is actually to give them the exact medicine that they, that they needed to not form in the first place. 
And so what we're doing at Ho'oponopono is that we're directing love to ourselves, to those hurt places. And there's a whole process that I that, that I lead you through that, that helps you do that uh, through four phrases. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. And I, and I really um, – I spend a lot of time breaking down those phrases and what they really mean. I, I'm not of the proponent that you just say those four phrases and something magical is happening. I think you have to really understand – um, what it is that you're actually doing, but essentially it's it's inner child work. You're actually going to that part of you that learned the low self esteem, the the uh, uh, the the fear about life, the fear about myself, the fear about the way I look, the uh, um, the the uh, fear about money, whatever it is. We all learn these things as children, and to go back and to attend to ourselves as a loving parent now, and saying you don't have to feel that way about yourself. That's a mistake. That was never supposed to be. I understand why you chose that and it made sense at the time but I'm in charge now and I love you and I'm so sorry that you feel that way about yourself and please forgive me for all the times that I have not been here to to uh, address this in a different way and thank you for going along with me now and as you do that over and over again the mistaken identity of the problem of our godlessness begins to lift and that's what that process is that is a such a I'm, I'm trying to keep my woohoos down sometimes I'm over the top but woohoo because <laughs> when we get at and attend to ourselves as our wounded inner child and we say, it's okay, it's all right, I still love you, and we go through this process, I believe that changes everything. Well, again, to love yourself as you love God. So if you are extending love to yourself, you become – you you. You create a vessel that is in sympathetic vibration with the love of the omnipotent, which only wants to shower us with love, but we have to be in alignment with it in order for that to happen. And so the Ho'oponopono practice is such a, a spiritual practice because it's not just addressing the, the unconscious problem and the inner child, but it's aligning us with the same love that the, that the divine wants to bring to us, which is the thing that actually heals the problem. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So where can people go to find out more and to find your phenomenal book, A Shaman's Mind? Well, it's available where any books are sold, The Shaman's Mind, Huna Wisdom to Change Your Life by Jonathan Hammond. And you can reach me at jonathanhammond.com. And I am available for, uh, for private consultations as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And before we dive into some little fun something you're coming up with on the spot at the end, any last words of wisdom, Jonathan? And I'm like a kid in the candy store. I have so, so enjoyed your, uh, the time with you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, how about the last bit of wisdom, uh, or the last words of wisdom be, be part of this, uh, this ex uh, experience? Perfect, perfect. Good. So just take a moment, close your eyes, and just bring to mind something that you're struggling with, something that you need advice on, something that feels, uh, that feels like a little stuckness in your life. And just feel wherever that is in your body. And we're going to do this quickly, but this is something you can do in a slower way. And just imagine yourself holding that in some way. And now just direct these words. So just silently repeat after me. Just say to that little stuck place, that, that hurt, that fear, just say to that thing, I love you. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And thank you. One more time. Just tell that thing with as much sincerity as you can muster. I love you. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. And just begin to feel that all around your head and your body, that there's an energy holding you that's holding you in the same love that you're holding this little difficult problem. Just feel that all around you and come into alignment with yourself and with the divine. And so it is a mama. Woohoo! You've left me wordless, Jonathan. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks. Mahalo. It's such a pleasure. It so goes both ways. Got to crank it up for the finish here. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get a shaman's mind, and begin loving yourself up as the divine today and shine bright. Woohoo! Awesome, 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 my brother. <laughs> Well, you're, I love you. You're amazing. And you're like, uh, you are, 
there's such a sophisticated understanding that you have and like you're so walking the talk and like uh, you're so in integrity and and yeah anytime you ever want to have me back what what a, what a gift to be with you you're really wonderful if you're watching this then you are a light worker you're a light warrior and i want to help we offer everything from boot camps, mini masterclasses, full on masterminds, and private one on one coaching with me. To find out more about our upcoming courses, simply visit inspirenationuniversity.com or click on the links below. And to find out more about coaching, simply visit inspirenationshow.com backslash coaching. We also have weekly YouTube live events with me where you can ask me your questions live and YouTube premieres featuring me and our guests. Simply subscribe below and click on the bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows. I just had the most beautiful, phenomenal Shaman's Mind interview with Jonathan Hammond. I can't recommend his book enough. And wow, wow, wow. Talk about needed wisdom for today. To check out more incredible wisdom-filled interviews, click here, subscribe below, be sure to click on that bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows, YouTube premieres, and live events with me every Sunday night. Of course, check out our classes, mini master classes, and boot camps by clicking on the link below, plus coaching one-on-one -on -one with me. Huge thumbs up if you like this. Leave your comments. Love you guys so, so much. Shine bright. Woohoo! Love you guys.